All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm talking with Jen Shears, and she's way up in the great white north of Canada, Newfoundland. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'm up here in Newfoundland, out in the North Atlantic, freezing our butts off, but it's a nice sunny day, so I think we're going to get outside for a bit. Also, what, like, do you guys get a kind of, because you're kind of in that same latitude in England, and England kind of doesn't really have winter, winter, but it's kind of like damp and dreary. Is that how winters are in Newfoundland? Yeah, depending on which part of the island um, you're in, it, it really varies. We don't get like the deep, deep freezes that kind of central Canada or central um, United States would get. We have more of a moderate temperature so hovering around freezing or just below but we get a lot of snow like we get buried in snow um i think in the winter we get eight ten feet of it it's just it's a lot speaking of buried in snow you posted those so you hunt you're the first person i've interviewed that hunts uh oxen muskox yeah. excuse me muskox Mus right muskox yeah. yeah where did I you where was that in newfoundland where was that no, no. In Newfoundland, really, our three only big game species are moose, woodland caribou, and black bear. So anything else that I'm after big game wise, it's off the island. So muskox was up in Northwest Territories. Um, so yeah, way up north, out west in Canada. Uh, yeah, it was that's far. Freezing. It was, it was, you know, minus 40, minus 50. 12 hours a day out in it and um it was and i have a circulatory issue i have Raynaud's uh, disease phenomenon and um so my my hands and my feet go numb uh the blood drains from them because my blood vessels uh, constrict. they constrict is it oh they constrict okay exactly so there was a big you know i had a big concern going into that um but i used copious amounts of hand warmers and body warmers <laughs> tucked everywhere and, and made it work it was quite an experience so how do you hunt muskox? I mean, I would guess because anytime I've seen pictures of them, it's always just barren with snow. So their food, they must travel for food. They must like find spots they, or something. They do. They, they're they in kind of herds. And so they'll trample down the the snow and get at what's underneath. So yeah, you, you rely on, there's not too much in the way of land structures, but you do rely on them to get behind them and begin your approach on them. Um, you dress in all white to blend in with the snow, obviously. Um, whereas something like a caribou, you uh, you dress in white not to blend in, but to look like one of them because <laughs> they, they see something white and they're like, oh, what's that? And they think you're one of them. So you can approach. But for a muskox, you really want to hide. So the white camo is what gets you closer and close enough to, to get at them. So you hunted for 12 days in bitter cold temps and finally got one? We did. So we didn't hunt for 12 days for muskox. I actually went up there um, on a combination muskox and polar bear hunt. Um, polar bear? Hunt, no uh, shit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's probably the hunt that's given me the most flack really in, in my hunting. But I think it's because it's largely um, misunderstood. Um, oh, you mean from like feedback from people yeah yeah exactly the, the common narrative is that polar bears are endangered which which isn't true um they're not endangered and depending on um some populations are dropping but the vast majority are really healthy populations and actually polar bear numbers have never been higher they've never been recorded to be higher um worldwide so um they're doing quite well and you know when in the hunting industry and lifestyle we always talk about using science to determine whether hunts are sustainable and should go ahead. And so this particular one has been deemed to be sustainable and non detrimental to the population by the scientists, by the people on the ground. And, um, you know, a lot of good comes from it. Um, in terms of scientific research, we had to take dozens of samples to submit to the, um, to the officials and everything there. And then the cultural aspect is just incredible. We, ate the polar bear feet with elders in the indigenous community there. And it was, it was just magical. It was quite something. So yeah, polar bear and muskox there. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. I thought they were, I thought you, I didn't know you can hunt polar bear either. And then, yeah. but then you, you made your argument was as good that. Yeah. It's just like any other animal wildlife biologists, they study these animals and they determine how their populations are doing and how you can, how many they can harvest. So, Exactly. Yeah, it's not like they're just saying, hey, go kill them. You know, there are right, people yeah. that monitor. 
Absolutely. Oh, monitored more than anything. It's kind of like mountain lion. In some parts of the world, the population is really dropping off, but in some parts of the world, it's absolutely booming. And the area not only can have a harvest, it needs a harvest to get everything in balance. And um, when we were up there on the ice flows, we saw um, 12 polar bears in three days, a good mix of uh, mature males and females with cubs. One had twins and stuff. So yeah, it was, it was really cool. My background's in environmental biology as well. That's what I took in university. And I spent many years working for Canada's National Parks Service. So conservation and wildlife management ecology is near and dear to my heart. Um, so I, I would never want to do anything that would be detrimental to a population. And so I've, all my sustainability boxes were checked with this one. So you've always, when did you get hunting as a child? Like with your family, is your family big hunters? Yeah, my my um, family is hunting Newfoundland. Um, we we are a big hunting island just by nature of needing food security. In order to get any food to the island, you're talking an eight hour boat ride or a plane ride. So back in the early 1900s, the government Which introduced means expensive. Yeah, exactly. It means it's expensive, and also if there's a big weather event or a global pandemic for example yeah, and for example. <laughs> supply supply chains are cut off it, it it can be a big deal so um in the early 1900s the government of newfoundland introduced moose to the islands so that we would have um a, a real good option to sustain ourselves so hunting is deeply ingrained in in our blood and in our being and i always joke when i was growing up if i didn't eat moose or bear or rabbit and partridge and all that, I didn't eat because that's what was served in my house. Um, so I would, you know, tag along with my parents when I was younger. Um, my, my mom hunts, my grandmother is 90 years old now and she got her moose this year. And, wait, wait, uh, wait, your grandmother's 90, she just got a moose? She got her moose again this year. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> She's that, if you go out on my uh, page and See, scroll and, a little bit. And that, and that right there is a testament to you talked about growing up and food that you ate. Yes. So I'm guessing that a lot of food you ate was natural wild game, organic as it can be. And look at Absolutely. her health. She's she's shooting moose at nine years old. That's exactly right. Yep. A life living off the land and being out in nature does wonders for the for the body and the spirit. Oh my god, ninety. She's still moving around and everything functioned just fine. That's yeah, she's awesome. doing well. She that's her, her the, thing is so far so good. <laughs> that's my goal is to be able to be, you know, that's my, mainly why I work out now, so I can be able to move when I'm 90, you know. Oh my god, that is what what did she get it with? Did she sh rifle? Um, yeah, with a 308, I think. Oh my god. We're yeah. and and she was out there like she wasn't sitting in a chair at the on a porch. No, like, no. Um at, at my parents' cabin, um, there's a good vantage point. So they spotted one and they were just able to walk down the hill and um and she got a shot at it. So it was, That's it was awesome. Perfect. Yeah, it was good. Where you where you where you live sounds I've never seen a I've seen a moose once. Once? Yeah. And it was on a bus in Wyoming. We kind of went mm, by it and that was I <laughs> how how does how like because I want to get into like you talk about I I I really also am impressed by how I'm going to talk about your New Year's Eve meal that you prepared because that was very cool. But out of all the game animals that you've had, which do you have a favorite or like one or two that are your top three? Um, so I guess moose would be way up there, but I, I almost don't even think of moose as a, as game meat anymore because it was just the staple in like our a house. Cow? You pretty much, it, yeah. We we ne we haven't bought beef ever. We might buy a steak, ev like as for a special occasion, every now and again. But we've never once purchased like bur burger meat made of beef. Um, so aside from moose, I think my top all time is mountain lion. Cougar meat is it, it's the most surprising and just the best that I've I've ever I've, eaten. I've heard that. I've really heard that. It's weird. It's of the few predators that really you can eat, you know, um, grizzly bear, depending on what they're, I guess you really can't. And wolf, you're definitely, mm -hmm. although Randy Newberg apparently tried wolf. And I had wolf? a chef on, I, I had a chef on here and he said that he had, uh, he, I forgot what it was, but he ate uh, coyote burgers. Coyote, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't coyote. Tried, I haven't tried. I, I not to say I wouldn't, but I just I haven't. Um, lynx is good. also good. Another, it's another cat type, you know, species like like the mountain lion. Right. 
but the meat is it's a it's a white meat it's like pork tenderloin only better it's it's so where do you yeah. where do you hunt where do you hunt mountain lion in canada do you go uh, again do you go out, out west more out west yeah i i got mine on vancouver island and so there they have hmm. um a huge population of mountain lion and i think residents out there can harvest two a year um when we were uh following mine following the tracks for a couple of days i think we we followed it over man 30 kilometers or so over the course of a few days and um we passed a few kills that it had uh that it had taken down or was sitting on and so yeah they're having a real impact on the ungulates out there so that's why residents are allowed to to harvest two a year so you pretty much all across canada yeah yeah um certainly like my sheep hunts and stuff uh they've been in canada um we did go to new zealand and south africa that was in 2017 and 2018 but there's so much close to home um in terms of north american species that we that we enjoy hunting um and so my i i would like to get my um, my super 10 i just have one left which is uh, an antelope um, a pronghorn. So hopefully that'll they, happen. Are they in the prairies in Canada? Like they, they, are, are here? they are. Yes. Are they? So that'd so, be like Winnipeg, like the, was that? So Winnipeg is Manitoba, right? Well, yeah. Winnipeg is in, or yeah, Winnipeg is in Manitoba. Yeah, exactly. Um, so out, yeah, out, out around there, um, also potentially in the States. Um, so it, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, for the longest time, deer is what I had left on my list as well. And it's so funny to people because they everyone grows up hunting deer. I just I just shook my head when you said deer. I was like, really? That'd be like this I think of one of the first things you kill. <laughs> but in Newfoundland, there there are no deer. So, you know, I had I had hunted in South Africa and New Zealand and been on mountain goat hunts and sheep hunts. And here I was going on my first deer hunt, and everyone at camp was laughing at me. <laughs> wow. That's odd. That's like one of the first <laughs> yeah. ones everyone d- learns how to yeah. hunt. That's have, it. Uh, we just don't have. Now, them. when you hunt, have you hunted in the United- here in the U.S.? I haven't actually. Um, I did go down to Gunworks uh, in Wyoming to their Long Range University, so I was doing some shooting down there. But I haven't actually hunted, and I was supposed to go to New Mexico last year with Bear Hide, which is a, a rifle um, case company that I'm working with. But COVID threw all that out the window. I was also supposed to go to Alaska last summer as well on a sheep hunt, oh. but COVID again, canceled that. But having said that, you know, some good things have come out of it because although it sucks for the outfitters in Canada with the border closure, it really opened up opportunities for Canadians to get hunts that would normally be out of reach for us, um, you know, price wise and accessibility wise. So I, I got in um, an unexpected dolls sheep hunt and um, a bighorn hunt. Carrie and I went to Alberta and we doubled on bighorn um, one day the summer. So, so although it's been, it's been bad, it, it was a good hunting year for us. So if you were to come to, do you have to pay? I mean, do your sponsors cover your fees or do you have to pay out of pocket to hunt? Yeah, no, we, here? we, we pay for our hunts. Yep. So, if you were to haunt, say, New Mexico, do you just pay non-resident fee or do you also have to pay some sort of internationals? So, so that one, when that one does happen, hopefully this year, fingers crossed, um, I believe that there will be, I believe the, the company will be facilitating getting the tags and stuff for that. Um, they know the owners and stuff. So I'm, I'm not sure how it works. I haven't delved into it because I haven't had the chance to, to go there yet. Um, but in Canada, you, you buy your licenses, you pay the outfitter. Some provinces have hunter host programs where you can, um, if you have relatives in a different province, they can host you and be your guide kind of thing. Um, but, but that doesn't exist for the types of animals, like the, the sheep and stuff that we'd want to go hunting. It would be more for like elk and deer and stuff. So So you just, I'm sorry, you can't just go on a you have to get an outfitter to hunt in canada even as a, yeah. even as a canadian resident as well yeah we're it, it's go it goes by province each province has their own huh. tech system so um some places ha- you can put in for a draw for very limited tags and very limited species but as a whole 
um, you do need to go through an outfitter. Like here in Newfoundland, if you want to come and get a moose or a bear or a caribou and you're from a different province, you would 100% need to go through an outfitter. There's no lottery tag system whatsoever for non-residents here. Have you connected with Greg McHale out there in Yukon? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I know Greg. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've never met, but uh, he's he's a really cool guy. Got some nice right. things going on. And uh, yeah, one day when I'm back up there again, maybe we'll cross paths. This this year, it was different because of COVID still. You, you wanted to minimize your interactions and stuff with, right. with people. And we weren't even allowed actually to go into town until we had quarantined for 14 days, which we did up in the mountains. Thankfully, the government allowed us to just go directly to the backcountry, and they counted that as quarantine. Because what, what else do you want than <laughs> some people in the middle of the wilderness? What, what better quarantine can you get? Um, but uh, you, we still were a bit tentative with, you know, get being around other people. So hopefully, when the world becomes more normal like it used to be again, then we'll be able to see people and <laughs> meet meet new people and stuff. Yeah, well, he was on. He was my fourth guest on this podcast. He was so cool. Yeah, and then just the I watch him, and he's out there freaking icicles on his face and <laughs> eyelashes, and it's freaking dark, and he's got his headlamp on, and oh, I'm just enjoying the outdoors. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's <yeah."> right. <laughs> yes, yeah. no, he's pretty. He's pretty intense and in an intense place. So you you need to have your personality match the landscape that you're on. Oftentimes, and in the Yukon, that's what you have. Yeah, that he does. So, um, so you grew up hunting, and then you went to school. Obviously, you're because you're in environmental uh, biology, right? Ecology. Okay, That's right. Environmental biology. Yep, the ecology is involved in with that. Was yeah. that was that inspired by just growing up and being around it all the time? And you just decided, you know what, this is what I love to do. So I'm going to study this my where I you know my what I enjoy. <laughs> That, yeah, that had a lot to do with it. Um, initially, I was going to be a French teacher. So I I took French immersion in school. So up until grade seven, my whole day was in French. I never took any English courses until grade eight. And I thought that that was an important thing to be able to pass on to people. So I wanted, it gave me a lot of um, opportunities in my life. So I wanted to be able to pass that on to children. But then when I started working with Parks Canada as a student, when I was 16, um, I realized like it really ties into my values, to my upbringing and, and all of that. And at the same time, I can, I can teach about biology in French if I want to, when I do my interpretive walks and bring people around, showing them the geology and the nature that, that's around us. So I can incorporate all of it. Um, Canada is a bilingual country, so there was ample opportunity for that. Um, but yeah, taking environmental biology uh, was it was a natural fit for me because it, it's how I was brought up and it's everything that we valued as a family. Yeah. And speaking of family, I see you, even you getting your little girl involved. All right. How old is she? She is seven now. And actually. she went on the, didn't she, if I read this correctly, she went on the sheep hunt or something with you guys this year? She did. Yeah. So that wasn't planned necessarily, but COVID, you know, has made us adapt a lot. And we thought um, if we were going to go on the sheep hunt and be away for, I say, I say two weeks, but my sheep hunts never really end on schedule. They go on and on and on and on. So there was a potential of being away for a month. And then the thought of coming home and being away from her for another two weeks to quarantine because in Newfoundland, you need to do that. It was just too much. So we thought, well, let's just bring her along. We'll, we'll roll with the punches. We'll see how it goes. And now the background of that is, a few weeks before we were taking her, she would, we would go around a little flat lake for a one mile walk and she'd cry three times because she didn't <laughs> want to walk. So we were like, oh, well, how's this going to go? But she, she sucked it up and she was, she was a trooper and it was, it was pretty epic to see what she, what she did and accomplished. How old can she, when can she hunt? When can she start? How old do you have to be in Canada? It, de it depends from province to province. It varies. So here in Newfoundland, despite the deeply rooted hunting tradition, up until I think two years ago, you had to be 18 to get what? a big game. Wow. Like, it's insane. So thankfully, they've changed it. it it's still 16, which is old, but it, it's progress anyway. Um, but she has her mind set on going to BC or Alberta, somewhere where you only need to be like 10 or 12. Uh, to get her 
her first big game animal. Oh, she's already playing her first big game hunt at seven years she, old. Wow, look is, at that. Yeah, she is. She's got her she's got her sights set on it. So we'll we'll do what we can to make it happen. It's unfortunate that she can't get her or probably won't be able to get her first big game animal here at home, but it is what it is. We'll do whatever we can to help her get one as soon as she wants to and is able wherever it is. And your husband hunts as well. Is that is he also an environmental uh, work? So he took um, a two-year college program in fish and wildlife technology. Okay. So yeah, um, the environmental science component was deeply rooted in that too. Um, so he grew up in the outdoors. Like we started dating when we were fifteen. Um, okay. So so g- going out on the land, fishing, duck hunting, rabbit catching, and all that was was part of our dating life and part of our relationship from the start. So, um, yeah. He's thinking I scored big time here. (laughs) Oh my God. That's awesome. I I feel the same way. So hopefully. Yeah. You're like, well, from a, I'm just like, from a guy's point of view, it's hard to find, you know, it's here. This will go back to social media too. I'll see like the hashtag women who hunt. And that's what right. I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to find guests. I'll, I'll, you know, I, fi- I think I found you that way. I can't remember, but I found. But I'll look at the profile, and you'll say when. And I've seen some, and I'm like, where the hell are you hunting in your pictures? <laughs> I mean, it's it's all like Vegas. One girl had nothing but jewelry, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, okay. So you know, it's, it, yeah, it's I don't know. You, you gotta. That's that's what I mean. Is as a guy, it's hard. It's not as common. Let's put it that way. It, right. it is more now. It's definitely more now, uh, without a doubt. But back, you know, I was talking about when I grew up, I didn't know a girl hunted. <laughs> no. I, I, and and the fact that it's changing is one of the main reasons, like, that I put myself out there to really help facilitate that change to happen faster and more widespread. With, with the attention that I get sometimes, it's not always good. Like, you know, I get death threats. It's stressful. People oh, threatening I was going to ask you. So literally so, people, because yeah. they see your picture and yeah. I mean, come, uh, that's insane. I mean, people got to get over themselves just because you don't agree with something doesn't mean you got threatened their lives. No, you know, have a, have a, have a conversation. You know, that's the big word now. We're going to have a conversation. Well, why not have a conversation about something you don't agree with? And maybe you'll have an understanding instead of just saying you're going to. That's insane. I'm no, sorry you have to go through that. Insane. Thanks. I, I just find it ironic that, you know, eight or nine times out of 10, when someone is berating you or harassing you, you'll go to their profile and in their bio, the first thing there is, like anti-bullying and mental health yeah. awareness and stuff. And I'm like, that is, that is the irony Woo. too. I mean, they're, they're all pro <laughs> inclusive this and anti that. And they're the That's first right. one to come after. Being open-minded, being open to new perspectives and everything. And then, and compassionate. So yeah. in the name of compassion, they're threatening really awful things to people. So I don't, I, I don't know how they reconcile that in their heads. I haven't figured that one out They don't. Yet. That's the no, problem. They don't because they, they can just type words and without just an incend and <laughs> that's yeah, right. no rational thought behind it all. That's so, so yeah, that, uh, yeah, that, that, I, that hate. I don't, I don't need, I like, I don't, no. I don't need that in my life. But the reason I put myself out there is for the messages that I get saying, I want my wife to come on a hunt with me or begin exploring the outdoors a bit more. And so you're, posts are really helping me to encourage her and show her that she can do it. Or my daughter really enjoys having someone to look up to. And I mean, I don't, I don't profess to be like the ultimate role model or anything, but if, if they can take tidbits of, out of what I'm doing and use it as encouragement to get people outdoors or to realize they can, you know, get through the hate that they may get in return, then that's worth it to me. That's the whole reason I, I do it. I'm going to guess, though, out of the majority, most of them are positive. You probably get those ones, like everything. Yeah. It's And it's always that that little one that has the loudest voice. That's where corporations are just like, oh, we got to we gotta cut this person off. And it's like mm-hmm. one or two people, you know, that just ruin it. That's right. Yeah. No, but by, yeah, by far, it's, it's positive. The worst 
worst comes when um, a celebrity or someone with a big reach picks up on one post that they don't like, and then they share it to their audience and solicit them to come harass exactly. me or whoever. That's really when it gets overwhelming. And then you need to like, I don't, I don't mind that stuff, but where it concerns me is if, they all start reporting it, then there's a risk to the account. And again, that's first world problems, yeah. but it would be really inconvenient if, you know, it all got shut down. So that's where I'm, that's where I, I don't really, I don't really like it and I'm mindful of it, but, but it is what it is. That's what the block button is there for sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so one thing I want to like, uh, I want to circle back to, one of the things that I loved when I saw your New Year's Day preparation, your meal, and the cool right. thing is what you did is all the, the meals that you made, you had those game animals, like pictures of the, and that's, right. that was so cool because now you're seeing, okay, you see some meat, but this is where it came from. This is the animal, and, you know, yeah. that's, that, that's, so what gave you, the, is that something you always do? Is that a traditional thing or is it something you thought of or? Yeah, it's something that we thought of. It's a it's a tradition now. I think it was our third or fourth year doing it. Um, it. For me, it's just about celebrating the year that was and the year that was involves all of my harvests and sharing it um, with my community, my friends, my family and um, really getting them giving them the feel of the field to table process and um, and it, to have the pictures there like some people I haven't heard people say this, but I'm, I, I get the sense that some might find it a bit odd that the pictures of the animals are there next I'm to sure. the plate. But yeah. to me, it, it's a concrete link to, to see exactly, like you said, where that yeah. meat came from and, and an acknowledgement and an appreciation for the animal that died so that we can have this meal. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was, uh, something that we just that I came up with a couple of years ago and it's just grown from year to year and now people ask if they can come to our house for new year so that they can experience you it. know as you're explaining I was just thinking man I wouldn't have to bring anything because she's gonna have a big old <laughs> spread down here exactly. I could bring like a bottle of wine or something she's gonna have all the food yeah, that's right well I do make a mean sangria a big vat of it so you don't even need and, to bring wine yeah. <laughs> hey just bring yourself that's even yeah, better exactly. that's awesome <laughs> And, and it, which means also that you do all your processing and everything, right? You, oh, like yeah. sustainability. You, you like all of it. from the kill, the cleanup, everything you do all of that. Everything. Yeah. We're, we're involved elbows deep, armpits deep. And, you know, right from getting the animal to bringing it home, processing it, preparing it, serving it, eating it. Um, so it's, it's really cool. One, one of the um, best examples of that whole process that, I'm proud of and, and so happy with was in 2020 last year as well. I got my first archery black bear and one of my girlfriends came along with me and she's a non hunter. She was there for the sit, for the shot, for the tracking, um, for the processing, for the preparation and for the first meal um, from it. So that even went a step beyond what we do at new year's Eve because people see the picture of when we got it and then they eat what we prepared. But my friend Jen was, was with me for the whole, the whole thing with my black bear and, and that kind of upped at another level for her. So, um, sharing that is, is huge to me. One thing I've, I've learned about black bears cause they're really greasy and a lot of fat on them. Do you take the, the fat and render it down and use it? And I've heard we people use it in baking a lot of time in baking. Yep. You can make soaps and stuff out of it too, which is, which is neat. You can grease your boots with it and everything. Um, we don't use as much of it as we could or should, but it's something that I will get into more. There's, there are so many purposes for it. Candles as well. You can make some pretty cool ones. Um, yeah, the, the uh, opportunities are, are endless, really. It's fascinating. Um, what's your favorite, because you said you're bow hunt, what's your favorite weapon, bow or gun? I, I find it really hard to pick between the two because they're so different. Like the, the mindset and everything is, is different. I love the proximity that you need to be in with your bow you know you need to be in that really tight really need to be in that tight range um but 
but I love being able to handle my rifle well and I, and knowing the intricacies of it and the, you know, the possibilities that I have with it. Um, so yeah, they're just two, they're two very different things. I love them both equally for different reasons. Have you hunted, uh, elk yet? I have. Yes. Have you? I got an elk, um, in BC and I, I got it with my rifle. Now I, I could have gotten one many times over with a bow. I had, I had elk screaming at me at five, six yards, um, the year before, but the area has a six point rule and all the elk that would come in were these gigantic fives. So although they were like jaw dropping, I couldn't take it because they, they weren't legal. Um, so had they been legal, I had them close enough to, to get it with a bow easily. The one I ended up getting though, I ended up getting it at about 400 yards, um, with my rifle, but I was really thankful to have the experience from the year before because that made me, um, understand and appreciate what elk hunting really can be to have them coming in. And there's like an elephant in the forest coming at you and the trees are rattling and stuff. Uh, if I had just gone that second year and, you know, got an elk at 400 yards, I, I wouldn't have really known what elk hunting could be. So at that point, that was the hardest I had hunted without being successful was that first year elk hunting. And I, I took it really hard. It was heartbreaking for me because I had always been yeah. successful on my hunts. But at, once I got the elk, I truly valued and cherished that, that experience. It was probably one of my favorite hunts ever. And I, and I never harvested anything that first year. It's very addicting and it's very frustrating, like you said, to because <clears throat> I live in Texas, so there's no elk here, and then you have to travel, so you don't have that time to immerse yourself in the wild and be mm -hmm. there and get you to elevation. And, and but I did have that opportunity two years ago in Utah, and what a dirt! I mean, I was out there all the time in the elk, and and then you when you smell them, they're that close, you can smell them. That's even. Yeah, that's uh, now you're it's bringing it back. I, I love it. Ha have you uh, called? Do you call them? I haven't personally. Now I was with a guide and, and he and he did. I didn't want to screw it up. Like I'd be I'd love to try and learn it and get good at it. But I, I can't even really practice to see if it works here in Newfoundland. I'll call in a bull moose or something. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but uh, I would love to get proficient at it. it it's pretty fascinating to me do you call moose do you do that because it's just like that, that moan right yeah the, yeah, yeah that that kind of thing you can you can have well we called in a moose last fall from over two kilometers well over a mile away and uh he was walking kind of in the opposite direction and he let out the big ball and thankfully the wind was heading his direction and you could he was in mid walk and then you could you could see his head turn and you knew that he caught us a little bit. And then, man, he started making the beeline right towards us. And he covered that ground and there was a big valley and everything in under 10 minutes. He was just like possessed. You could see the whites of his eyes and everything when he got within, he got, we got him to five yards, this massive bull. And then he, I was bow hunting. He stopped behind this fallen log and I couldn't get a shot off. I was at full draw. And he was right there, his, the whites of his eyes looking at me, and I couldn't shoot. Finally, he I guess he didn't wind us at any point, but he definitely got the sense that something was up, and he and he left. If I had my my rifle, or even if I had been like four feet one the other way, I could have got him with my bow. But you know, that's that's what brings us back to try to get those opportunities yes. again. That's what I, that's the one animal I definitely am looking forward to. Going to be moving to Montana here, so. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm going to be excited because then I, I can hunt so many animals there. Oh, it's, kind so of like, it's kind of like BC. Like I always tell Carrie, like, we should just move out there for a few years and try to get <laughs> try to get some uh, different species and and not have to pay crazy amounts of money for them that you often do. Speaking out there, did you run into grizzlies at all? In BC, I saw one, but from several hundred yards away. In the Yukon um, this past summer, I saw two, and they were they still weren't weren't within like close close range, but two hundred yards or so. So still too close for comfort for me. Oh yeah, but, uh, but yeah, they're they're massive animals. Yeah. 
And compared, because I had uh, the Montana wildlife biologist last week. He's their bear management guy. And he said the, the grizzlies and polar bears are closely related in size. And I think it's just because the, the polar bears got the white fur, but I, I, I can't remember exactly, but he was talking about that. How close have you been to polar bears? Oh, two polar bears. I, when it was on the foot, I was a hundred yards from it. Uh, yeah. How big They're huge too, right? They're absolutely massive. So the one that I got um, measured nine foot seven and they do get to 10, 11, 12 feet. So pretty huge. Oh, What's you that? can because you talk. Yeah, because you t- early. I was going to say yeah. can you eat them, but you were already yeah. talking about. Yeah, you're already talking about that early. It's with the, definitely uh, a distinct taste. Like I, I wouldn't say it's for everyone. Fish. Um, yeah. Well, in Newfoundland, we we eat seal. We have a seal hunt here. Seal. We, okay. That's right. Oh yeah. And, and so that's what polar bears taste like to me. I mean, you are what you eat, right? Like that's what they eat is seals. So. Um, I can I can see how and why they would taste almost exactly like that. Have you had Have you hunted seal? I haven't hunted seal. No. Um, I I will hopefully maybe this year or next. It's it's a um, it's a lot more complicated than it necessarily needs to be for the seal hunt, given that we have seven to ten million of them off our coast and they're eating themselves oh, wow. at health and home really. Um, so it's a, but the animal rights people have fought so hard against the seal hunt that it, there's a lot of red tape that you need to go through in order to get a license. So you need to take a multi-day training course typically and stuff like it's, it's the only, it's like the only species I, that I know of species specific that you need a, a course to, to be able to go out and, and do the harvest. But it's gotten such negative attention over the years that the government implemented it to try to humor those groups and say, well, we're going to do it as humanely as possible. Veterinarians developed a, a three-step process to harvesting the seals to make sure it's done humanely and all of that. So there are barriers in place, but hopefully I'll, I'll get the course done and, and I'll be able to go out. Carrie has hunted seals though in the past. So, so how how are you supposed to humanely hunt? How, how do you go about that? Like what is... How do you hunt so, them so I, to meet the, their standards? Yeah, the whole the whole thing the animal rights groups were always putting out there is that the seals were being skinned alive, which which isn't true, but that's what their media thing put out there. So in order to um, to go through the three step process, it involves shooting at first. Um, it involves um, it. It sounds bad, but crushing the skull to make sure that it's it's killed. Um, and then having it bleed out before you you take the meat and take the fur off of it. Um, so those three steps need to happen before the fur and the meat removal is is permitted. Um, it, it all stems back to back in the when when people see seal hunts or think of seal hunting, they think of the baby white coats, the yeah, white baby yeah. seals. But that hasn't been permitted in Canada since 1987. So you know we're talking 30 odd years ago, 33, 34 years ago, or something. Anyway, at that time they were babies, they were like infant seals, and they wouldn't run away. So you could actually go up and and club them on the head, which is what gives us the whole bad rap. But when you think about it, it, it's actually the most humane way because it's instant. It's blunt. They're not on floating ice pans when you're trying to shoot with your gun, you know, on the seas and stuff. Um, But since that got banned, now you're dealing with older seals who are independent and can run away. So you can't just walk up to it and (laughs) clock it, right? So you do shoot at first. Um, from a distance and then you, you carry on with the rest of the that process. Is there meat good? Yeah, it is good. Um, I don't necessarily like the traditional seal flipper dinner that is common in Newfoundland, but um, you do a bit of <laughs> the seal flippers are really good. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, so people say like, I, I, I can, I can handle it when there's less of the fishy taste on it, but the seal loins and things like that, when you cut that up and you sear it or you even put a batter on it and deep fry it, like 
it, it's awesome. There are some chefs around Newfoundland that are doing some really cool things with seal and they're um, expanding to different parts of Canada. They're exporting the meat and um, yeah, there are seal festivals and everything that happen where chefs prepare it different ways. And then I have a business that sells seal fur products like boots and hats and coats and mitts and stuff. There's also um, the, the oil, omega-3 oil fr- that's rendered from seals is incredibly healthy. And uh, so that's, that's a big market as well. So there's lots you can do with it once we can get past the misinformation and the lies that the animal rights people put out there. Now it explains why I'm trying to, um, the shark, the, the call, have you heard of O-Search? The guys who take the, they capture the great whites and they put them on that hydraulic lift and they're like a NASCAR pit crew. They literally, oh, wow. they literally, they'll catch these great white sharks. They'll, they'll guide them onto this platform. They'll lift them out of the water. They'll uh, fill their, 